So hello, everybody. We have a really exciting and fun topic to talk about today, all things Border Collie Puppy. Um, so I'm really pleased to welcome Pauline Whitaker um, to chat with me today about puppies. Obviously, I've got my new puppy. She's now 15 weeks old. Pauline, you're about to go into the world of puppyhood again. Yeah, my puppy is only four weeks old, four and a half weeks old. So haven't got him yet, but um, I have visited him twice already. Um, and obviously very excited, lots of nervous anticipation about bringing him home and starting to think about what I want to do, what I want to achieve, what sort of character he might be, um, hanging on every word that the breeder is sort of telling me about him and every photo and update she's she's sending. Fantastic. So we are going to talk uh, about lots of different things about um, bringing new dogs into the home. Obviously, we've both um, having puppies from breeders this time round, but we've both also had rescue dogs before. Um, so we're going to also chat about the similarities, the differences um, and all things puppy. So um, shall we start with how we've selected the puppies that we've got or just got? Um, so obviously we've both selected a breeder that we were happy to um, get our puppies from. Um, for me, it was because my last dog, Bo, came mm -hmm. from this breeder. I was so pleased with him um, that I went back to the same breeder again. Um, I knew a lot of dogs that were related to both mum and dad. Um, I was looking for temperament, good temperament, um, and also obviously a dog for sport, for um, agility and obedience. Um, so those were sort of my criteria. Um, obviously the breeder health tests, um, and his dogs have good temperament, which is also really important to me if I'm selecting a puppy. Um, and he raises them and gives them lots of really good experiences um, in those early formative weeks. Um, so how about you? How did you yeah, so it was well, slightly different. So it's not certainly not a sports dog background, although a lot of the puppies from this breeder have gone on to compete in agility. So I'm um, quite quite successfully I think um Hoopers um but primarily he's an ISDS registered um, breeder so he trains the breeder trains his dogs for sheep work um and I he lives in the area close to me I've been aware of him and been on a training course a sheepdog training course a very long time ago with him so I've been aware of him um, the really nice thing about his setup is you can see generations of these dogs so there are there are previous litter um puppies from a previous litter from the same mating the dad and the mum are there there are aunties there are cousins I have met uh, the grandparents previously when I've been there um, so it's just really nice to see all of those temperaments there um, to see the environment they're being brought up in um, so it's it is it is a farm type environment but the puppies have got well, one of the lovely things that, that I saw when I went to visit um, the puppies the first time was that the other dogs could come in and interact with the puppies, but they they kind of won at a time. It was never overwhelming to the pups. One dog would jump over the fence, go and have a little sniff of the pups, and then go and jump up, out again, just like they just checked on them. Yeah, you're still there. We know about you. And it was just this lovely interaction. Nothing was overwhelming for the pups. But, you know, those puppies are going to grow up with lots of dogs around them, um, which are going to teach them to feel safe in the environment, to have that little bit of interaction as well with other dogs. So yeah, I really, I really, really liked the setup there. It was um, great. So different, def very different from yours, um, your breeders, but but equally as valuable. Yes and no, in effect, because um, so the breeder that I got sparkles from has a lot of dogs. So okay, the, yes, of course, yeah. So um, I think he's, I lose count, um, 10 or 12 possibly. Um, and as as with yours, they have interactions with those dogs. Um, so they have a lot of positive interactions. Um, so they have interactions with obviously other dogs. They have interactions. Um, he's got a little daughter, so children um, and other people as well. So although maybe different than being on a farm, um, still lots of similarities there with um, the, the nice healthy interactions um, that they're having. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. And that feels like a real added bonus, doesn't it? Because often, you know, even a, a breeder who who is fantastic, they just don't have uh, the opportunity to expose them to that many dogs that early on. So that just feels like an added bonus, really. Yeah, definitely. So bringing puppy home. 
Um, yeah. We've both got other dogs as well. Um, so for me, I don't just bring my puppy in and let them all get on with it. I think that that can be really overwhelming. Um, I always think when we bring a puppy home, it's almost like kidnap. <laughs> and that sounds really awful but we're taking them away from everything they know we're a strange person even if we've been to visit them beforehand bringing them into somewhere that they don't know um so yeah so my puppies come in I have either a pen pen is the ideal for me um but this puppy actually came in and went what's this ladder here for went straight up <laughs> straight out over the top um so that very quickly got changed wow to- Yes, rather than <laughs> so it has a lid on it. Um, yeah, so I have mine in a pen to begin with. Yeah. I usually set the pen up um, beforehand so the other dogs can get used to a pen being there. Um, so sort of preparing them in advance. Yeah. Um, and then for me, I allow them in. They can come into the room and they can actually see the puppy that can sniff through um, the crate or the pen if they want to. And I start them off that way rather than just flonking puppy into the room and either puppy being overwhelmed or the other dogs not wanting to interact as well. So I'd love to hear how you you do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And very similar, Sarah. So I don't have a big I don't have a big house, but I have um, two big rooms downstairs. So um, and I put a stair gate between the two of those. I can have sectioned off areas and then I'll have the pen in the kitchen side of there. Uh, A big pen, enough room probably to put a crate in as well in case Pup wants to go in there. If it just ignores the crate, the crate can come out soon enough. But I'll put the the crate in there as well. Uh, A big pen so that they can play in there. They can uh, you know move around freely. Um, But actually to start with, I'll probably have my dogs the other side of the stair gate and just have them come in one at a time. So there's just a little bit of interaction through the the pen. Um, And I'm really mindful of how my dogs, my current dogs will be feeling at that point as well. (laughs) as much as the puppy um because i suspect the puppy is just going to be yes it will be overwhelmed with a new environment but this puppy is going to be like oh new new friends new friends so and and i think my dogs will be a bit more sensitive to a new dog coming in especially a little one because they're not used to that so so that's going to be managed very very carefully yeah yeah Yeah. i'm really mindful about that Um, and that pen will stay up as long as i need it and as long as all the dogs need it so that there's we can just set some boundaries and manage the behavior yeah definitely so it's been really interesting for me with obviously Minnie and Ding because I had them prior to Bo um, and they both followed the same pattern as Bo coming into the house. So with Bo, Minnie took a week to um, accept him and then all of a sudden one day she came up, did a little play bow and goes, come on, let's play. And then yeah. that's all fine. Um, Ding took four weeks with Bo okay. and he took four weeks with Sparkles as well. Okay. Um, but now he's a great babysitter. He plays with her. He rolls around on the floor. Um, he's totally puppy appropriate. Okay. She's a really full on puppy. Um, and if she's too full on, he will just tell her off. But it's it's not that he's going to floor her or anything, but he'll tell her off enough that she knows that she's been inappropriate. Um, yeah. So he's teaching her some good skills as well whereas Minnie's a little bit softer and just takes it um so I think Ding is really good for teaching appropriate skills um yeah to the puppy um Bo interestingly I thought would be the first one to want to play with the puppy um he doesn't oh <laughs> yeah so he's taking a bit longer um and it's been really interesting watching his body language because he's a sensitive boy but with a really hard eye and he stares and then he freezes and he's really uncomfortable. Puppy is dying to play with him. He can accept her being very close, but he doesn't want her to touch him. Okay. Um, so we're having to teach him at the moment. If you're feeling uncomfortable, move away. Yeah. Uh, so that, yeah. So that he's okay. She's okay. Um, but he's just starting out on walks now together to go play chase oh okay and he's encouraging that um sit right next to him as long as she doesn't want to jump on him um yeah he's he's warming but he's taking his time um and i'm i'm really laid back about how long it takes because i've got them all for life so for me it's much more important that this works yeah Um, 
And if we take time and don't put them into poor situations, then they usually all come around at the end, yeah. don't they? And, and I think um, it's great that you are spotting both how Bo is feeling, but also Sparkle's characteristics. But it's also good that her needs can be met with the other dogs as well. So we're not we're not ending up with a really frustrated puppy there as well. Um, most of the problems, if I go out to clients that have got interaction problems between their dogs, are where those interactions have not been managed in the early days, yeah. and those behaviours just get accidentally um, for sure, but they get laid down. And either the adult dog doesn't know how to tell a dog off, and we almost expect. Some people tend to expect adult dogs to be able to do that. Um, and, and some of those adult dogs just don't want to be pushed to the point where they have to come in too hard. And we never want our puppies to be that scared by an adult, a resident adult dog anyway, because that can also cause permanent damage to the relationship. So it's so important to just manage those early greetings and allow both sets of uh, both sets of dogs to feel safe. Yeah, definitely. And it is definitely helped sparkles like I say she's been quite a tricky puppy um since I've managed to get her integrated fully with Minnie and Ding um yeah. she's definitely becoming easier um whereas you know she is such a little social butterfly um if she couldn't have interacted with any of them then like say her frustration levels would have been absolutely enormous so yeah yes and I have um of my other dogs I have two collies two collies who I know are going to be much more sensitive about the arrival of of the puppy and then I have a terrier who um, is from Romania and she loves to play so I'm going to have to watch that she's not too strong with the pup but I know that she's going to want to play with with him um so that's going to be who I try to buddy him up but of course we make these plans and it doesn't you know, I will see what happens at the time and it may not not may not match that at all so I will adapt um depending on how they all tell me their feeling. Yeah, absolutely. And there was a little bit of me that actually didn't worry that the other dogs didn't want to interact with her too much to begin with, because as I said, she's so independent, this one, um, probably the most independent pup that I've ever had. Um, so as well as climbing out of the puppy pan on day one, um, <laughs> yeah. she literally in the first week went to chase my horses that were quite a way away. Um, and there was none of the usually puppies stay reasonably close when you're out and about this one didn't okay so I was like mm. <laughs> really proper independent a yeah, problem here yeah really independent and even when I took her out with the other three dogs um if I called the other three dogs she could still be going the other way um if she was interested in something okay um, oh okay this is going to be a real um you know a recall mission yeah <laughs> It is coming, I will say. Um, but that was something that was in my mind was actually if she then buddies up too much with the other dogs, where am I going to be in yeah. a list of, you know, favorite things? Um, because her recall could have potentially been awful because of her independence. Um, yeah. And then if she was even more focused on them, then I was not going to be, you know, anywhere. Yeah of interest for her so I spent those first few weeks getting her really really into me um so that then the other things didn't matter so much um and you know I can call her from the other dogs um and that's taken taken some work shall we say yeah and I was just going to ask you actually whether that that independent streak was just environment dependent or whether it was also really noticeable in your home and how you if it's meant you've had to work harder than you expected on the relationship yeah, it was everywhere. It was okay. literally everywhere. Everything else was of interest to her. Um, it, so this just also goes to show you can do all of your planning of yeah. looking into your breeder, looking into their lines, but you still get a little pup that with their own individual characteristics. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, she wasn't... Uh, and I'm still working her out. I, I'm going to be totally honest because, you know, it changes all so quickly. Yeah. Even in when I went from the pen, which she climbed straight out of, we then put her in a crate and she's looking up at the roof for a way out. Okay. She was okay in there. She wasn't stressed about being in there, but she was looking for a way out. Um, I've got a courtyard just outside of my kitchen door. Um, and the walls are higher than me, but she goes around scanning for a way out. <laughs> 
she's like a wild animal walking around you know, <laughs> in the courtyard going, how am I going to get out of here? Um, so everything about her was to do with independence. Yeah. Um, so when I started working with her, obviously we've built a lot of toy play. She was very chasey. I saw that literally from that first day when she spotted the horses way further away than what I would expect a pup to be interested in them in. Um, So I knew that that chase drive was right in there and strong at that age. So I've used a lot of chase games with her, um, bowling, um, running off with the tug toy, getting her to chase after me. And that's what's really helped our relationship. Um, So I usually teach them shaping, just really simple shaping as youngsters. She would probably do it twice and then she would check out. Okay. Okay. It didn't matter where I was. Something else was always more interesting, even if it was sniffing a wall or do you know what I mean? Like it wasn't like I was doing it in busy environments. Um, So then I just started marking and rewarding everything, disengagement, the lot um, so that I devalued disengagement. Um, So um, I've worked a lot more on play and reward and impulse control within play. Yeah. Um, She's going to need a lot of impulse control. Um, she's a very strong little pup. Um, and I've put less into what I would call formal training at her age because the relationship had to come over everything else. Yeah. Oh, and you know what you're doing with that training, that you can catch that those mm-hmm. bits of that up at any time you want to. Because if the relationship's not there you're not going to get those behaviors you might get them in uh, an easy environment but you're certainly not going to get them in a different environment so you're laying down the 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 basis for that aren't you through the relationship I'm curious just um and this is a little bit for my own personal interest could you see I don't know if you how early you saw her in the litter but could you see any of that independence quite early on or did it only appear when you brought her home it only appeared when I brought her home and um so um the breeder would probably laugh if he could hear us talking now because I rang him within the first week and I said um so what he described her to me as one of the softer ones in the litter they were all reasonably level but if he had to choose which was the softest which was the strongest she was one of the softer two I could not find anything soft in her whatsoever (laughs) um apart from her hair Um, (laughs) So I'd planned, you know, as you've probably got planned, things you're going to do with your puppy. I'd planned all this confidence building exercises. I'd collected loads of um, plastic bottles to use in a like paddling pool for like noise desensitization and yeah. confidence building. Well, I haven't really needed to do any of that because she's the sort of puppy, and I can't even believe this, So I got the paddling pool out and I got the bottles out. I could literally just turn the bag over with all of them, dump them all in. And she's like, yeah, what's this? (laughs) I grabbed a bottle, ran off, played with it. Um, No, um, no fear of anything. Um, So I've really had to change my plans of confidence building because she doesn't really need to build confidence. She does need obviously exposure to all of the things that we would, you know, want to expose them to at that young age. Um, But for her, it's really, really important with the impulse control because she was so strong. Yeah. And does she take that? Sorry, I feel like I'm asking questions at the moment, but does she take that, um, that put that confidence into new environments too? Does she kind of just walk straight in with a swagger of what do we got here? And I'm, I'm here, everybody look at me and what am I going to investigate next? Yep. Wow. Yeah. She's as near bulletproof. um, Yeah. Amazing. Things like that. Um, Trying to think of some things that would have, so Bo was, um, quite different he was very sensitive pup um and so I did work on like noise with him and all things like that and I think she heard some big noises and literally did not bat an eyelid yeah Um, wow so and even in what I would class a normal puppy you would expect to see a little reaction and then an awareness recovery um so I think it was in her first week, she climbed inside of two washing baskets. We'd got one on top of the other and yeah. just starts digging away. And um, with that, they fell over and landed on top of her. 
and she screamed and I was like oh no you know she's terrified lifted the washing basket off of her she came out she turned around and jumped straight on it <laughs> okay and I was like wow well look at that recovery <laughs> yeah Whereas amazing I've run away and then looked at it and you know been a bit cautious about coming back none of that whatsoever no um if something happens she's going to go and she's going to go and investigate it and you know she so lovely confidence yeah I I love the sound of that though Sarah I really do you know a, a border collie that doesn't have that sensitive streak that you know that's a gift isn't it in so many ways and I know that there are you know you're so aware of the things that she is going to need from a training perspective perspective because they're different to the the average border collie but but actually a lot of the work is there do you think it's genetics and upbringing do you think it's those things do you think it's some other stuff as well do you think it's just Um, luck of the draw is it just that's that particular puppy you got the bulletproof one um it's a really good question I don't really know because um all of the family and relations that I know that they're bred with temperament in mind um so yes they are sound temperament of the dogs um but saying that Bo is related um and he was he was a sensitive pup yeah Uh, and the funny thing is that when I went to see Bo as a puppy and when I went to see Sparkles as a puppy they actually did some things while I was just observing them that were so similar okay they both looked like they were thinkers they would maybe they'd interact and they'd do this stuff then they might go away and just sit back and watch and observe um and I observed that in both of them um but they're actually so far different (laughs) in in their personalities um she's the one getting into trouble he's the one going she's getting into trouble (laughs) (laughs) policing it (laughs) he'll come and tell tales um (laughs) doing something wrong he's a bit of a good shoes um so yeah totally different um kettle of fish with this one Um, yeah but um i do think that although you know she's robust she's strong um and that side of it i did have problems with her for the first sort of few weeks um with more excessive biting than just normal puppy biting and I think this is something that's really important to look at because um I think it was stress induced um Mm -hmm. I think there were three things I think coming away from the litter really did you know change her it created more stress than what um we would have liked um she had an upset tum and definitely when her tummy was upset she was really angry and bitey um and I think she's had problems with her teeth as well because um, her little bridge of her nose was swelled up oh. so, and her teeth were um, were a bit sore. So I think those three things have played a lot into the bit, a little bit more of the bit that I wasn't expecting with yeah. the biting and things like that. And I think that that's, it would be really easy to label her as, uh, I hate saying a bad puppy, but all the characteristics that you wouldn't really want, I think we're down to those three things. I think it was stress, her tummy and her teeth. Yeah. Because actually in there, there is a really nice puppy and everything that I wanted in a dog. Um, but I that first week when I was thrown a little bit by these behaviors that I wasn't expecting, obviously we'll talk a little bit in, about rescues in a moment. So Ding came to me at five months old and then I had eight months of hell living yeah. with him because um he was a biter he'd learnt all of these unwanted things and I sort of got that in a smaller eight week old package um and I was like crikey you know this could go horribly wrong um if we don't you know work with her and find a way through this very quickly um so yeah she's been some work um but she's yeah. she's coming through and you know she is going to be a cracking little dog so yeah yeah it really shows how much we have to be flexible in our expectations though doesn't it you know we can have this picture of what what it's going to look like to bring this this puppy home mm-hmm. and it's necessarily going to 
fit that at all and having the knowledge and the awareness or knowing who to ask not in our case but knowing who to ask for help with those situations is so critical if you can't find a way through it and the things that you've described that perhaps um influenced her behavior could all be connected too so stress can impact the digestive system a food is obviously eaten through the mouth so if the teeth are hurting you know and and then she's eating that food onto a stressed tummy then mm. and then a frustration is just expressed um with the mouth as well so but yeah. if you're expressing that frustration and it hurts too it's going to make you more more angry isn't it so we always have to look at the emotional state of our dogs when they're exhibiting behaviors as well but also possible medical causes as well and just be really sensitive to it's not always things that we can see and obviously you were, you were incredibly aware of that yeah and I think as well you know puppy biting is something we're all going to experience um but what is normal and what isn't um yeah you know Bo was a, a bitey puppy but a normal level of biting yeah um I used to laugh and say that she had anger management um or she needed anger management um she would launch at you and bite and hold on um which isn't normal for puppy no um they're going to explore the world with their mouth um but hers was very extreme um whereas now it's much more towards a normal level okay biting um so she is coming through that but um you know you, you want that very early um yeah they have some sort of bite inhibition um as early yeah. as possible really so yeah, yeah. And, and I don't know about you but quite often by the time clients come to me for help with this actually that behavior has become really established and yeah. it's so much harder to to change and it, it it's so easy to accidentally reinforce that behavior as well that it <laughs> you know, the behavior gets strengthened. People never mean to do this, but accidentally, you know, each time the puppy bites, they put a toy in their mouth and it's not a distraction. It's not a, just a redirection. It's actually the puppy starts to learn, okay, well, that's the way to get you to interact with me. And it's suddenly a, a well-established behavior and provides, you know, it becomes the start of the reinforcement for them. Yeah. And again, some people say yelp like a puppy would or another dog would. <laughs> um, she she caught me off guard. I'm going to be totally honest because I, I wasn't expecting it. And um, when she was displaying this behavior, I jumped and yeah. my hands came up and back and she came at them. Yeah. Um, and I was like, oh gosh, you know, I'm really going to have to not make a sound when she does it. I'm going to have to regardless pick her up and put her in a pen um, or her crate, obviously, because she can get out yeah. of the pen. Um, and I had to do that. And we actually had, um, which again, I've never had to done with, do with such a young dog. I've had a trailing house line on her um, from eight weeks old so that if I needed to, I could pick up the line and move her rather yeah. than having to get my hands in and then make yeah. my hands an issue. Um, I've worked on obviously a hand touch so that we have a positive association with coming to my hands. Um, and I've used a lot of tuggy play to teach her within the game of tug impulse control yeah Uh, so um yeah we've sort of approached it from lots of different angles um yeah and it and it and it's great really to hear that you've had to think about it so carefully with all of your knowledge it's not just been just to fix it it's not been you haven't been able to bypass all that you know we are still going to have to deal with those problems even with all the knowledge that we have from you know our years of experience and previous dogs but it's still got to be managed really carefully to make sure it doesn't become an established problem yeah and I've been shopping for numerous all the different things that I can give her to chew on um so that she can chew out any frustration she can bite appropriate things um yeah yeah so we have huge (laughs) cupboard fulls of varieties um she likes novelty um if you gave her the same thing every day she'd lose interest in it so she has um toys that we rotate she has chews that I rotate um so yeah she um it's yeah. a full-time job, Sarah. <laughs> it, is. Yeah. it is. It is. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. But the good thing is the toilet training has been quite easy with her. She's so clever. Yeah. 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 Um, learn so quickly. Um, yeah. But again, they learn the unwanted things so quickly as well. Yes. Yes. I was delighted to get in the message I got from the breeder today because they're the puppies in that where where they're coming from, they have a, an outhouse area. So they they they're part of the household, but the door is just open the whole time. And they're just toileting out on the grass now. now. They don't they don't even go inside now and they're four and a half weeks old. I'm delighted. <laughs> I'm hopefully, of course I, I may have to adjust my expectations, but I'm hoping that a tick gets put in that box quite early on. So 
Yeah, no, that's really nice. Um, Sparkles was really good, actually. So, um, yeah, I think that was something that, you know, obviously you're still going to have to work on it a bit. Their bladders are the size of a pea when they're yeah. actually charging. Yeah, exactly. um, but yeah, um, she definitely, she got the idea before she came. Um, yeah, perfect. It's good. Yeah. So um, how would you see this differently to introducing a puppy to introducing a rescue dog? Um, any different plans with your guys? Yeah. Yes and no. Um, a lot of similarity in some respects, really. And But I think I would probably expect to take it. Well, you know what? It depends on the personality of the dog. And of course, if you're bringing in a rescue dog, it does depend on, on the age. So I have brought rescue puppies home and then actually the process has been very similar um, and it's been management right from the get go but with a with a slightly older rescue dog i've been able because they've been vaccinated and they can go out some introductions in outside areas have been been a lot easier often taking along a second person as well but then you know the new dog on a long line um, and just having extra space around as well always trying to avoid somewhere where there'll be too many other problematic situations that could arise so a secure field or a very quiet location um, but actually that helps prior to bringing a dog into the house. And I've done that with foster dogs as well when I've taken them in for sort of rehab work as well. Um, but then just management and and being very careful about behaviours that you might not be aware that the rescue dog has. Like, you know, meal times are going to be managed much more carefully. Re, you know, any resource could be problematic until you, you know, and that that might be access to me. That might be doorways, um, you know, access between the, the two areas. Um, it could be toys. It could be the water bowl. So I had a, a foster dog for several months last year and he would he would resource guard quite strongly from the other dogs. Now, luckily, none of the others would respond to that. But even a water bowl for him was a resource. Yeah. Um, a, a piece of paper on the floor could be a resource initially. Now, we worked on that, you know, right from the beginning and it with a lot of management, I have to say. But and it dissipated fairly quickly. Um, and then it would only really be um, if he was in a stressed or aroused state that it would crop up again. But um, yeah. yeah, so watching for things like that. Yeah, it's um, interesting you say that with the rescue dogs, because we tend to then think, oh, you know, they've come in like that. But actually with Bo, um, although he was the angelic puppy, actually, I recognize the potential for resource guarding on day one with him. Okay. He all of his toys, put them on his bed and he lay on them virtually doing that, going mine. Okay. Uh, so as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, Okay. It, they're the high value to him so I worked so much on toy swap with him to make sure that he felt safe and comfortable um, with that so even with a puppy we want to be aware of not allowing these things to start in the first place yeah uh, I've done with the puppy I've been doing you know dropping food into the bowl um, and little things like that would so that she associates my hand coming to the bowl with something positive with something being added um, so I still do um, all of that with them, even if they don't um, look like there's going to be a problem, just to make sure that there is. Yeah, yeah and that's so important. I, I see a number of behaviour clients which have, uh, again, it's, you know, there's so much misinformation that people have access to on the internet. You know, the, the, there is still the idea that we should be able to take the food bowl away from the dog. We should be able to put our hands in their food bowl. We should be able to take a chew out of their mouth. It's... <laughs> You know, I, I always ask people to, to to consider how you feel if somebody tried to take your dinner away. If it's just when you, you know, be put in front of you at a restaurant or something, we're not going to like it. We're going to complain. And it's quite natural that a, a puppy or a, a dog would do that. Um, and it's so easy to not get it wrong, but it's so easy to cre accidentally create a create a problem. Um, and, and people not recognizing those warning signs, those early warning signs. So, you know, he growls, but it's okay because I can still take it is is not good. You know, that's that's the puppy is showing puppy, all the dog is showing signs that of stress at that point. So and, and it may well escalate. So it just has to be handled differently to that. And and right from a puppy, like you say, dropping food into a bowl while they're eating, doing swaps, doing little cheese trails away from something if they've taken something that you don't want them to steal, not running after them, not making it a game, not teaching the dog to hold on to things and, you know, run down the garden with them. Yeah. So yeah, the crazy. puppy has just started to be allowed a little bit more freedom. Um, but with that... You know what they say, a quiet puppy, be worried. Um, she's usually <laughs> up to something. Um, so she's very interested in my shoes um, and she'll run off with a shoe. Um, and so 
is she is exactly the sort, although the, at the moment she doesn't show any signs of resource guarding, she's such a strong puppy that you could quite easily teach her or bring it yeah. out from her. Um, so I've done lots of work with um, Sharad Patel's counting game. Yeah. Um, and like I said, a release cue on her toy um, and offering impulse control around it. I always swap everything with her. Um, yeah. She does find possession of treasure extremely rewarding she usually does the zoomies okay so proud of it you know yeah uh, yeah. So, yeah and a, and a lot of puppies actually need to be allowed to parade with things you know we can we can teach them we've got to give up everything they've got in their mouth but actually it can be really rewarding for a dog to be allowed to have something so just making sure you know i save all my um, recycling so they can have boxes on the floor they can have the plastic bottles they can have things to carry around and I won't try and take those off but I might I might get the puppy used to me stroking them while they've got them and I'll just tell them they're really clever for having it in their mouth and for carrying it and talk to them while they and interact with them and you often get as a result of that well I with not always but I've certainly seen and on lots of occasions the kind of the soft body language that they get when they it's oh you think I'm doing well doing this as well and you know they're even more proud as they parade yeah. around but we then we become part of that and the interaction with us instead of that I've got something I better dart off with it which yeah. I often see in in problem cases so it's it, it, again it's so easy to avoid that yeah ding was a resource guarder um and so the more cheerier voice i used with him like oh my gosh what have you got show me your treasure you know um and he was like oh i'm really clever aren't i i've, I've got something and okay. mommy wants to you know me to show her what i've got um so yeah it was um trying to prevent that happening with our baby puppies as well yeah definitely definitely so yes. um, there's obviously the the collie eye as well which we must talk about in puppies because obviously that can come out at different ages um obviously mine has it already <laughs> um she's very strong eyed already um but some it can not really come into play until they get to sort of adolescence so um is there anything that you do and watch out for with your puppies or your collies anyway um yeah so I'm always going to be prepared for it happening um I'm always going to presume with a collie it is going to happen uh, and actually one of my rescue dogs it was definitely there when at the point where I got her so we can talk about how I kind of changed that um yeah. separately but with the pup the most important thing is going to be the engagement with me right from the start and then almost preventing as much as it's possible, setting up the environment for success, but preventing the pup, preventing him from having access to things that might trigger that. So I'm not going to socialise him in a park where he can see a big open area and dogs roaring around and ball chuckers being, you know, um, used. So that's just going to trigger that behaviour in him if it's there and ready to come out. So I'm going to really manage that environment. And it doesn't mean I don't want to be able to eventually take him to those locations, but I'm going to be at the back of those locations or I'm going to be just out of sight let him hear some of the things in the environment to start with and I'm going to be there with my tuggy toy I'm going to be having a game with him but all of the foundations to that engagement will have been done at home in my garden in an empty park in a secure field and I will generalize that behavior as much as is possible before I put him into a situation where I say well can you do it with all of these distractions around so I'm really going to try and set that up for set that up for success um, and prevent it from happening now with the best will in the world we can't always do that and it could be triggered by a cat running past the bottom of the garden or a squirrel in the tree you know it, it can be the birds flying out of the garden we can't control everything in the environment but as soon as I see it I'm going to start working on it so you know that engage again engagement with me the alternative behaviors the the checking in with me whether we use something like a hand touch um, or like you said the counting game or just meaning if it was say it was triggered by things in the garden then the garden will suddenly become somewhere where there might be treasure hidden around different places you know I might do scatter feeding out there so that every time pup goes in the garden he goes looking for for something that, that of interest to find and he won't be looking at the birds in the sky or the squirrels in the bushes so just working on all of those foundations right from the beginning yeah, definitely. And um, so cars are something that is obviously car chasing is something that's quite um, prominent, shall we say, in yeah. border collies. So I'm always looking for their interest or lack of interest in vehicles. Um, I won't just uh, 
take them near a road um, and allow them to look at traffic um, because they're different between noticing things and actually looking and watching and then turning into eyeing it. Um, so that's something that uh, I'm particularly um, aware of, obviously working with a lot of car chasers. Um, yeah. Sparkles has been to, um, I've got a lovely little town um, and there's a car park which I take my puppies to, to do some focus work with me and training. Um, so again, little dream boat bow was great. Mm. Um, puppy, at, I was videoing, so I know the time frame, um, five minutes, and she started to become more interested in okay. the environment and the cars. So at that point we finished and we came home. Um, okay. So she definitely one that I'm going to be able or going to have to really watch that um, I don't overexpose her. Um, it may only be a few minutes here and there of different um, different places. Um, yeah. Very much controlling the environment. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and how would you, um, if she has an experience where she gets really triggered, what are you going to do next straight after that to then overlay that or to change it or to prevent that getting established into a habit or becoming something which really gets logged in her mind? Yeah, so I will remove her from that environment because I don't want to then try and push through it because if something else then happens in that environment, we're sensitizing rather than, um, you know, habituating them to it. So um, I would then take that as information for me, um, which I did. I put her back in the van and we came home and then I'm going to strengthen me and yeah. my focus on me more so before I go back to that environment so that we've got more skills under our belt and a bigger and better relationship um, before yeah. I expose her to that level again. Um, she's been now to, uh, so she went to a pizza party. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. She did some socializing with some people and there was actually a really lovely dog there as well that was so beautiful at playing with her. So mm -hmm. she had a really nice interaction there. She didn't meet all of the dogs there um, because even though she's a confident pup, I really, pick and choose I don't want my puppies to go I can interact with all dogs um, because otherwise later on they're going to go why can't I interact with all the dogs yeah. um, and if I think that the other dog is a little bit too strong I don't want them to have a negative um, experience because that yeah. can have such a big impact later on I would rather have less exposure but quality exposure than loads of exposure with some errors, if you like, um, yeah. with it, because I think that can have a real long lasting um, impact. Yeah. Um, so I'm yeah. cautious, I suppose. Um, some might say um, controlling, just like a collie. Um, <laughs> about the. No, um, I but... think I think that's really sensible. the The dog that I fostered last year, um, he came to me at five months of age. And slightly misguided, the trainer that they'd worked with before they called me in as a behaviorist had suggested he liked other dogs and he was fine with them at that point. And throughout his puppy heart, he'd been doing classes. But as part of the training plan, they'd suggested that he, they take him up to every dog they saw because he loved to interact with them. Yeah. When he came with me and I said, mm, you're not going up to every dog, you're, you're, you know, you're a rising teenager. Those hormones are just going to start to come out. This is not going to make you popular. Um, and I said, no, you can't. We got an almost instant um, frustration related reactivity started. And I had to work on that for, for months then um, to, to try and get so that I became valuable. Of course, when you bring a, a he wasn't a rescue, he was a rehome. He came straight from another family. But when he came into foster with me, he had no relationship with me. So we did. I didn't socialize him. I didn't walk him in public spaces. We we did a lot of secure field work. We did a lot of interaction work with me, a lot of laying down the foundations. It was a long time before I could then start to, and it was controlling. I had to control everything with that dog really to, to enable him to cope with that. Yeah. Um, but I remember you commenting on a post I put on Facebook after I think I'd done, it was my proudest, one of my proudest moments with him. We'd done a river walk in Worcester, which is a busy area. And he must've walked past 50 dogs and every dog he saw, hi mum and you know checked in for, for every single one it was it was quite incredible where he got to um, by that point but it was blinking hard work to get there yeah yeah and I think it's really important with our puppies to know where we want them to go and what we want them to be um, down the line 
Um, because like you say, if they're just allowed to play with all dogs, then it becomes incredibly frustrating if they can't then yeah. do that yeah. further yeah. down the line. Um, yeah. It's the same with, um, so obviously I compete in agility. So um, she came to a, her first agility show at the weekend, but she potted around the vehicle. Yeah. Take her anywhere near the rings. No. Because fast moving dogs in those rings are going to trigger her eye. And actually, I want to build calmness and confidence and focus on me. And at yeah. the moment, that would be way too much. And then I'm going to be setting her up in the future to go, oh, my God, the rings are so interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so she literally stayed around the van, did a little bit, a couple of minutes training outside, met some people. Um, and yeah, so that she could have good experiences. Um, and funnily enough, Bo didn't actually go on a walk with any other dogs until he was a year old okay wow yeah 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 well, very sensible again we're we're so often gone oh we've missed the socialization period but he lacked confidence and I didn't have access to suitable dogs to walk him with um so actually he was much better um going about it gradually he was movement sensitive and I think he was three or four months old he was reacting to other dogs moving um Mm -hmm. mostly through movement sensitivity not through you know wanting to do anything to the dogs I think there would have been a lot of conflict there um his herdy instinct was going I need to control that movement but if he'd ever been allowed to run up to the dog he'd have got there and gone oh didn't really want to be here so I worked on the movement sensitivity with him. Um, and then when we were ready and we found suitable dogs to walk in with, then we did, which was much later than what you would think of when people are saying, you know, you have to socialize your dogs. Yeah. Um, he had yeah. appropriate exposure to other dogs, but it wasn't as much as, um, you know, what maybe some others would have. No. And and it it's it's important that people don't have to feel, you know, our clients don't have to feel that they're taking a step back yeah. when they're when we're saying, you know, actually, you need to take him out of those environments because that, yes, that's where people want to have them eventually. But if we try and do that too soon, it's going to be to the detri- detriment of where you want to be in the longer term. But it's hard to believe that until you've kind of experienced it and seen the dogs come out the other side of that yeah. um, and know actually that is going to be beneficial for them. So, yeah. Um, it's, and, and not not thinking well I've done it for a month like, I'm going to go and test it now because then we can set the dog back right back to where they were so it's it is hard it's hard to kind of trust that process absolutely um, yeah and how do you feel about um so obviously let's all face it when we see a puppy we all go oh and we want to cuddle the puppy and interact with the puppy so um how do you manage uh with your puppies in public with when people go, can I stroke the puppy, cuddle the puppy? Yeah, I, I'm. I don't. I avoid. <laughs> I, I avoid having to feel like I'm being confrontational by saying no. But yeah. I will say no if I need to. Um, I might do something like I have a lead that says it's. Uh, it's not one of the yellow leads that says you must keep distance, but it's one that just says in training. It yeah. looks a little bit like the guide dog lead. Yeah. Um, and I'm just thinking that maybe I'll say, "Oh no, I'm sorry. This 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 puppy's in training," and and very politely steer people away from me. But probably I'm going to I'm going to avoid I'm going to look busy with the puppy I'm going to have the puppy engaged with a toy or looking like it's training and I'm not I'm just not planning to put the puppy in that situation but there's two reasons really and one is I don't want the puppy to want to interact with every person they see but but secondly actually it can be quite overwhelming you know people often want to touch on top of the head puppies often don't like that um I I don't want to to trigger any fear um either so and it's really important to me that the puppy can just ignore people. The puppy can be comfortable with people around, can learn to settle on a mat. Um, I'm much more likely to sit at the back of a cafe away from lot of people, outside of the cafe than away from people, um, and have the, the puppy being rewarded for sitting on a mat. And I'm likely to only stay there for about two minutes. If that, you know, it'll be working with what the puppy can do to start with as well. So, but yes, I think we're probably singing from the same hymn sheet on that one, aren't we? Yeah. And, you know, it may be that we sound antisocial, <laughs> but actually with the long term goal, I think that socialization has 
maybe been misinterpreted by a lot about we've got to take our puppies out and make them have social interactions um whereas actually we just want positive interactions um and really it's more about habituating to the environment isn't it yeah and comfortable yeah. and really watching their individual body language um i don't tend to give people food so that they can get the no. puppy to approach them for food because i think that can create a lot of conflict um in the puppy maybe wanting the food but not wanting to approach the person um and that sort of thing and the same with a rescue dog from that point of view as well um yeah yeah, yeah two of my rescue dogs have been people reactive when they came to me and actually the only reason that that they well we we did i did a lot lot with them but one of the main things and the most important things to make them feel safe is to make them believe that they could that people wouldn't touch them they wouldn't try to interact with them so i was again very selective about who they were near and those people were given requests i was going to say instructions but they were given requests <laughs> not to make eye contact not yeah. to touch and just so that my dogs could learn that they could safely be around people um i might be uh, drip feeding them a little bit so that i was reinforcing behavior that i liked but even better enough distance that actually they could just be comfortable um, and learn that it was very neutral there was nothing to be there's nothing they needed to be doing, but it was safe to be there. People didn't mean anything um, threatening or nasty or intimidating or fear inducing, just that it is safe and that I wasn't going to put them into any situation that made them uncomfortable. Yeah. And so let's talk a little bit because we're making it sound like we shouldn't actually let our puppies meet anyone. Um, obviously, we do want them to sometimes meet people and have positive experiences. So um, I would maybe then do like a three second meet and greet. Um, I would call it that I give people instructions because I, <laughs> I can be quite controlling about, you know, <laughs> yeah. either you do it this way or we don't do it at all. Um, and I think that comes from having Ding who would bite people. So actually I did become very assertive um, about what people could and couldn't do um, around him. Um, so I, yeah, I'm quite bossy about, yeah, follow the instructions or no interaction. Um, but with the puppies as well, like you say, the staring, so getting them to maybe be slightly sideways onto the puppy to yeah. allow the puppy the choice as to whether they want to approach or not. Um, and I think that's an important one, allowing them the choice to approach, but also allowing them the choice to move away and not to actually um, yeah. approach. Um, and then if they do approach, say you've got a little social butterfly like sparkles, then actually I'm going to be working on that three second rule um, so that I can teach her actually three seconds and then I call her away and she gets rewarded for coming away. Um, so she doesn't just think that she's going to run up to everybody and then stay there um, yeah. as well. Yeah. And and I, I would use something similar. I wonder what you think, because I I don't like my dogs to sit in front of people to get get attention. And and, and we'll often we often don't want well, we usually don't want our dogs to jump up at people. So the alternative tends to be uh, thought of as being a sit. But actually, I don't want my dogs to feel like they're stuck there, particularly relevant for any dog who's nervous at all. But I don't want my puppy doing that either and thinking, well, I'm sat, therefore I'm going to get attention or I'm sat and then I can't get away from the attention I'm getting. But also, especially a puppy, if they're sat in front of somebody, you then tend to have somebody bent right over the top of them, a hand coming right down, down on top of the head. Um, and the last thing I want is that be then becomes unintentionally a negative association for the dog as well. Yeah. And it, so it's interesting you brought this up because so I have taught Sparkles um, an automatic sit um, purely because of impulse control. So um, when I taught her a release on the toy, then she has to offer a sit for me to restart the game um, because that was one of the easiest things to first have um, uh, to teach her to do. Then she now has to do a spin or a twist or a nose touch and then restart the game. Um, so I've put sits in, in different contexts, but mm -hmm. not for the reason of sitting in front of a person to allow them to um, talk to her. And yeah. again, this is what do we want in the long term? So for me with my dogs, obviously I'd want to compete in obedience and agility. And obviously it, as you work your way up the level, you can't reward in the ring. So for Bo, I tap my chest to get him to jump up as part of his reward. Okay. So for me, I don't mind my dogs jumping up. Yeah. 
so I don't actually teach um, dogs not to jump up on people because if you don't want them to jump up, don't interact. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't teach the sit in front to ask for attention and no pause um, off the floor and things like that, because actually my dogs do jump on me um, because I'm going to use that later on as part of a reward. But I totally understand other people that might have clean clothes that don't want them over them um, to teach alternative behaviours. Yeah. 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 And I just I think I just tend to go with avoidance or just trying to um it, and it does vary a little bit from dog to dog as well so hope who's one of my rescue dogs um she was incredibly nervous of people and i really don't want people stretching hands out to her at all even now i don't want her to feel like she's been put in that situation so she has a behavior where if she puts two paws onto people and she's very gentle she's quite a lightweight collie then that's her saying you may interact with me and actually if they didn't stroke her at that point I think she'd be quite put out because she's got braver and now she's saying I choose you and and she's she's making quite a point of I choose you yeah um so so that actually is a greeting for her but I've selected that for her because it's appropriate um and I wouldn't do that as a general rule but yeah. yeah it's interesting that you've got that so Ding who obviously was a biter and so to introduce him to people I came up with a little protocol so that he knew a pattern because if he understood the pattern then he felt safer about it and so his pattern was um the person had to stand not directly on not looking at him so they'd stand slightly to the side and they'd just stand there neutrally and they weren't allowed to touch him i would then cue him go say hi um he would be on a lead um and he could investigate them so he could sniff but he then would give me one of two signals that they were in they were at his his crowd and mm-hmm. one would be he would turn around and body slam them or the <laughs> would jump up and yeah. I knew very quickly that if he did one of those behaviors that's okay you're all right to touch him now but if they went to touch him before he'd done one of those behaviors then he would have bitten them um and I used a lot of the three second rule with him as well so that he wouldn't approach and then get that conflict and then not yeah. come away um but then he was always given the choice as to whether he wanted to go back um he learned the protocol literally within two people I think he actually wow. put it on the first person but when I then repeated it with somebody else he knew what we were doing and he was really happy about it mm-hmm. um, there are occasionally people that he goes and just looks away and he doesn't want to interact and um, I've had that funnily enough with a vet nurse um And so I refused to let them handle him because I knew that it wasn't going to be right. So I said, no, I'll, I'll muzzle him. I'll restrain him. It was to collect some blood from him um, because I've already taught him how to do all of those things. And I knew that if she tried to do it with him, then it wasn't going to be pleasant for him. Um, And it's only occasionally that he chooses not to interact with people now, if he's given that choice. Um, but he's very, very clear if he doesn't want to interact with somebody. Um, so he doesn't. Um, yeah. Sarah, it. he's incredibly lucky to have you. I mean, got him that far. It's quite a quite a turnaround, isn't it? I'm I'm lucky to have him. He's <laughs> <laughs> it's a two way thing. Yeah. We get the dogs that we need, not the dogs we want. And I think And they teach us so much, don't they? They yeah. teach us so much. Yeah. Definitely. I think that's really important to think of with our puppies as well. Um, because let's face it, we all go into having a puppy or a new dog with rose tinted glasses and it's all going to be about puppy cuddles and all, it's all going to be lovely and perfect. And then when it isn't, we need to look at why, what can we learn from this? Um, you know, it's opportunities rather than challenges. I tell everybody, um, (laughs) opportunity to learn. What can I learn from this? Um, yeah because otherwise it's nobody would get a dog would they if they didn't think that it was going to all end lovely um and all be an easy ride um and let's face it it's never really plain sailing for everything no there's you want a few well I want a few challenges on the way I look (laughs) forward to finding out what this next one's going to teach me (laughs) yeah I look forward to hearing about what (laughs) Well, it's been over 20 years since I've had a, had a puppy from a, wow. a breeder, but a puppy this young. So yeah. I think sleepless nights could be the first biggest shock. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
So let's go back back pedal a little bit to what are you going to do when you bring is it him isn't it yes it's a him yeah yeah how are you going to settle him in um to get him in the sleep routine to start with okay so my plan and I've been trying to work out whether I think having him upstairs will be best with me or to sleep take a mattress downstairs and I think I'm probably going to take a mattress downstairs um it feels like a long way from upstairs to downstairs and I want if that whimpering starts I want to get him out for that that wee in the middle of the night but actually I want him to be settled around the other dogs as well and to draw some comfort from having them there um, and just to learn where his bed is so I think I'm going to be downstairs um that's going to be my plan and then and then you know over a period of nights I'll, I'll see if I can extract myself hopefully as quickly as possible but um I'll do it that will completely depend on the puppy so I'll be down there for as long as he needs me down there yeah yeah I um I did a week with Ding and by day seven he didn't need me um right. anymore. um whereas Bo was a long time I actually slept uh on the sofa with him um in the pen until he was six months um oh, wow yeah but he was ill when he was three months old um he was ill and so I had to be there so that then affected he had to be on steroids which made him drink yeah. lots and then he needed to go out more and yeah <clears throat> that threw us um you know a spanner in the works as such um yeah so I tend to try and be downstairs next yeah. to you and with um the sparkles was really upset um that first night and so although I still had her in the pen <laughs> straight crate um I literally lay on the floor next to it so that we could yeah. touch through the bars um and I only needed to do that until she went to sleep and then I got on the sofa and I was right next to her but um she just needed that you know that, yeah. that closeness um that first that first night yeah. yeah. And and being able to adapt is really important, isn't it? But, you know, that little health incident with Bo as well, that's it's amazing how things like that and we can't predict those are going to happen. So being able to adapt our routine at that point is so is so critical because something like an illness, especially did he have to have any time at vets away from you? No. So I was really lucky because the vet was so conscious that he was so young um, that yeah. they really want to keep him in. So I was going in and out of the vets every day with him. Um, but he wanted me to be able to keep him at home if I could. Um, so yeah, bless him. Um, that was, it was probably a good week of in and out of the vets every day. Yeah. Uh, and there was a point where I was like, if we need to take him to a referral vet, I'll travel anywhere, you know, yeah. a little oh, up. Um, so yeah, but he was such, such a joy throughout. Mm -hmm. Um, he was oh. just cheery and easy and, yeah, he he is perfect, isn't he? Really? Oh, oh, Sparkles <laughs> has a lot to live up to, there, isn't she? <laughs> well, and this again is a really interesting thing, isn't it? Because I will try my best not to compare them. So even though they're from the same breeder, I think it's really important because there is nothing about them, hardly anything. They're both a black try, but that's about the only bit that's similar. Yeah. Um, in them they are so far polar opposites and I think if you put too much pressure onto what you want them to be yeah then their little character you're going to be disappointed regardless aren't you um yeah yeah, yeah. And, and I see a lot of clients where they've had a perfect dog previously they've maybe lost that maybe fairly recently so there's still a lot of grief around that yeah. and then they bring home a puppy and that puppy is you know is to try and fill the boots of that that previous dog and whilst that's done with the best intentions that's a lot of pressure for that pup and I think we really have to focus on allowing our puppies to be the dog that they're supposed to be so concentrating on the puppy in front of us not on what we our expectations are or what we want them to be but it's hard it is hard it is and um so even though obviously I get my dogs and I want to do sport with them if they didn't like the sport if they physically couldn't do the sport they wouldn't do it yeah. and they're still going to be my pet dog and my friend um so Minnie who obviously she's my mini American shepherd she was amazing to train in agility but she did not like the show environment so I tried to do it with her but she just she did not like it and in the end I was like do you know what who am I doing this for yeah. um 
and so we don't and she loves just being a princess um <laughs> she's designed to be a princess um <laughs> so she princesses around at home and she loves loves that okay. uh, there's no pressure okay. um no whereas the boys they want to be working and they want yeah. to be doing um ding enjoys doing sport because he's doing something with me it's not mm -hmm. necessarily because of the sport um so he does agility and he enjoys agility but he enjoys doing stuff with me over the agility um i tried to do obedience with him um just this summer and he hated being in that ring um he didn't like the that there were two strange people stood in the ring and nothing else to take his attention and he was very suspicious of them okay um, yeah so actually i thought you know what you don't have to do this no that's fine no. train and do other stuff and enjoy each other um Bo loves doing stuff with me couldn't care where we are who's around anything else as long as he's working yeah. um so you know all different characters um and yeah uncles is going to have to be under control in those <laughs> if things that think. things that make her think then things that make her think are going to be good for her then aren't they yeah absolutely and so that she's more focused on the job in hand rather than everything else that's going on around because she yeah. could be a really chasey dog um yeah as well so um yeah she, and you said that she doesn't particularly like repetition so that's unusual at border collie isn't it you know what one of the reasons why border collies are so prone to repetitive behaviors is that you know they will do things over and over again and often find real enjoyment in that so yeah. is this do you think that trait is going to stay are you going to try and how are you going to handle that to build her? So if she does something like competition obedience, that's a, a lot of the same thing. You know, building up to a round of heel work is going to require her to, to want to do that first yeah. and foremost, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm confident I can get that, which um, is something that it'll take as long as it takes. But I can I'm confident I can work through this. Um, I think there's there's things at play at the moment. I think she is a genius. And once she's done something once, she goes, well, I know that. So why should I repeat it? And then there's other interesting things like the world is interesting. So that's where the free shaping with the rewarding disengagement and rewarding everything. Yeah. Um, I may have to start with just one or two repetitions. Which, let's face it, as a trainer could <laughs> create frustration in yeah. me by feeling that I can't do enough. Um, but I'm... Pretty sure. And I'm going to be really interested. I might look back at this video in a couple of years time and go, oh, well, <laughs> that didn't work to plan. <laughs> um, but I still think that she will have that repetition um, once she knows what she is um, doing and once she starts to enjoy the work. Whereas yeah. at the moment, and I think this is really important with our puppies, we have to teach them how to learn. Because it isn't about teaching them the sit or the down or the the behavior. First of all, we have to teach them how to learn. So at the moment, yeah. she's learning how to lure, how to follow a lure. She's learning how to do shaping. She's not doing those exercises to teach her an end behavior. Yeah. Um, so with the shaping, we're going to be working through minute amounts of frustration. Um, we're going to be doing things together with no pressure um and that's going to be really important for her to not have the pressure um put on her to do stuff that she doesn't want to do initially we have to find that key of that enjoyment um and luckily i've got that already with a toy yeah yeah and, and i think uh, people often miss how much can be taught just through play sessions you yeah. know it's so incredibly important and and control around play so it's not indiscriminate play it's not just chucking a ball around but the interaction the minute bits of behavior we might ask for in between bits of play the yeah. bit of self-control where we don't let them access the toy straight away everything like that builds up into this bigger picture of yeah. needing to do something in order to access the resource the yeah. listening to the cue the ignoring the stuff in the environment you know whatever it might be we can build that in around play and it doesn't even feel like training to the dog there's certainly nothing serious about it and it's all about the enjoyment but the whole time they're engaging with us and they're building up pictures and understanding in their head yeah and if I'm doing something like teaching her to follow a, a lure I'll be literally asking for now two steps yeah 
Um, and then once I've done, and it's at the moment, I've built up to approximately one to two minutes um, of doing an activity like that. So either shaping or following a lure. And then I go into a chase game. So the control that she's had to use and brain power that she's had to use then gets released with something that she loves. So we're putting it together with stuff that she loves doing, like the running and the chasing and um, that sort of thing, so that it isn't just a hard session for her to process. Yeah. Um, yeah. So eventually she'll love doing um, the things. But yeah, she's she's probably going to make me have to think outside the box um, quite a few times, I would imagine. So. It's going to be interesting to see the progress, Sarah. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> <laughs> And I think as well, and uh, I'm sure that people listening will um, will relate to this, but sometimes we feel pressured that we haven't taught them enough. You know, they're this old and I've had them this many weeks and they still don't know X, Y, and Z. Um, I feel like I haven't taught her a lot. Um, in If I look back at videos of Bo, I'd, I'd taught him lots of, lots of little things by now but I've got to have a different focus with her. Yeah. That is relationship over training every step of the way. Um, yeah. Because if you've got the relationship, the training just comes. Yes. And like you said, she's a genius. So as soon as you put those cues into certain behaviors, she's just going to have them. Yeah. And she's going to have them because the foundations are there already. So, yeah, that's the plan anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it will be. I'm sure it's going to work. Yeah. Well, I would love to thank you for joining me for this chat about puppies and um, wonder if you would like to come back in a few weeks time and maybe update us. Um, Definitely. Whether your puppy is, should I say, going to plan. If, you, if I've got bags under my eyes and my hair's a mess and I'm wearing, you know, clothes from three days ago, you know how well it's going. <laughs> You've got as many machines sure as me. And... <laughs> <laughs> but yes, no, I've really enjoyed it, Sarah. Great. Thank, thank you, you very much me. for joining me, Pauline.